everybody. Morning. Uh, Dave, I appreciate your uh, your comments as always. Uh, I wanted to just add a little PS to them and say uh, you'll probably notice over the last few weeks uh, that I've been here, uh, I try to include a half page of questions in your bulletin. And uh, these questions, it usually says questions for further thought. A another chance for you to kind of soak in the word a little bit. And my, my goal with those is that you would take these and, you know, after, after our service, there's always a meal. Come and join us for that. Uh, maybe those questions would get discussed over that meal if you're, if you're stuck for something to talk about with each other. Uh, otherwise, you know, be the perfect kind of thing, maybe over a meal this week with uh, friends or with your spouse, to just pull that sheet of uh, questions out and say, let's, let's talk about this. You know, it, it, it's just another chance to kind of uh, ruminate on the sermon and, uh, and, and take a second look at it and discuss it with somebody. Uh, so often the sermon is delivered and, you know, we think about it, hopefully the Holy Spirit is tapping you on the shoulder with it uh, during the week, but this is a, a chance to encourage that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do, I'm going to sit on the stool, kind of make it my fireside chat stool over here, is, uh, hopefully it won't fall apart, is uh, say we're starting a new sermon series this this Sunday, Jonah, we're going to meet Jonah. Somebody told me you had somebody here within the last year who had memorized Jonah and did it as a live play. Mm -hmm. Yes? That must have been fascinating. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, so it'll be a little different. But um, I wanted to call your attention to the fact that there are four chapters in Jonah. So each week we're going to take a look at a different chapter of Jonah today, Jonah 1. So for next week, uh, during your scripture reading during the week, you might crack open Jonah 2 and read that chapter. You'll be all the more ready for my sermon but the thing I really wanted to call your attention to is the fact that uh, we've got basically three weeks until Easter. So we'll do Jonah 1, Jonah 2, Jonah 3, and then I think it's Easter. And then we'll finish up with Jonah 4 right after Easter. But uh, be thinking about who you might invite um, to our service on Easter. Uh, surveys that uh, you know, Barna Group and others have done will show that uh, many people would come to church if they were invited. Um, test that theory. Ask some folks. You know, I, uh, worst you could, uh, worst they'll do is say, no, I don't go to church, or I'm not interested, or I've got a church that I go to already. Easter Sunday is probably the most well-attended Sunday uh, by people, you know, at any time. So if there's ever a great time to invite somebody to church, it's Easter Sunday. Um, you'll notice there's a breakfast that morning. Uh, you know, let them know that they're invited to that. If they don't want to come to that, that's fine. Just uh, show up for the service. Um, I think it's going to be a special um, service that day. Uh, we're going to talk about the, you know, the, the joy that comes knowing that Christ is risen, but we're also going to address some issues and some um, some questions, some doubts that people might have about, did, you know, did Christ really rise from the dead? And um, we're going to rejoice because there's, you know, we, we know that he did, and we have good reason to put our faith in some facts that he did. So it's going to be a good Sunday. Um, you know, it's not often that I'll tell you, um, I think I got a good sermon ready to go that day, but on this one I'll let you know I think we got a good sermon ready to go that day. So uh, if you invite somebody, my my promise is not to embarrass you or let you down. So be thinking about that. We've got uh, Jonah the next four weeks, uh, except we're going to take a week off for Easter and be thinking about who you might uh, invite to church on that day. Well, um, Jonah it's a great little book. Uh, if Jonah is about anything, it's about uh, running from God. And I was, just was curious to see, does anybody here, how many of us here have a, a running away from home story? Say before you were 16, I see a hand over here, a hand over here. Anybody
Anybody else remember run away from home? Uh, I ran away from home, I'm told. I was a little kid, so I don't really remember this. But when I was six or eight, uh, I don't know what my parents did, but they offended me somehow. You know how it is when you're a kid. And I was out of there. You know, it's time to leave this place. And I threw some clothes in my pillowcase and tied it to a stick hobo style and, and walked to, out of the house. I'm out of here. You know, well, toward the end of the day, my dad came home from work and found me about a block away and uh, pulled over. My mom had probably alerted him, hey, Joel, you know, he's running away from home. And uh, so he pulled over and came over and talked to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm running away from home. You know, I've had it. And uh, he said, well, if you're running away from home, how, how come you're not any further? You know, what are you doing waiting around here? You're only a block from home. And I said, well, this is as far as I'm allowed to go. <laughs> <laughs> so even in my rebellion, I was still obedient to my, my folks. And I knew you could only push them so far, you know. Well, Jonah it, it is, a, is obviously a story about somebody who's running away. Uh, not just from his parents, but from God. So I want to give you a, um, a little background on Jonah. If you're interested in following along, uh, there are a few Bibles under the seats in front of you. Uh, Jonah's in the Old Testament. I think it's going to be in the 900 pages. Um, if somebody finds the page that Jonah's on in the Pew Bible, holler it out, the page <laughs> number. Um, let me give you a little background on, uh, on Jonah here. First of all, this is the one and only time in all of uh, recorded history in our Bible where we see God sending a prophet to a pagan people. Let that sink in for a minute. That means that 100% of the time, other than this instant, God sends his prophets to his people to straighten out his people. And this, this is, so this is the, uh, the exception that proves the rule, as they say. Uh, normally, God sends prophets to his people. Uh, I think the idea is that if his people are living the way they should be living, he's not going to need to send prophets to lost people because his people will be doing what he asks them to do. Interesting. Well, let's dive in here to uh, Jonah 1 1, and you can follow along your Pew Bible, or we're going to put it up on the screen. Uh, says starts off by saying, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, a few details here. Tarshish, I'm sorry, Nineveh, is a significant place. It's most likely the largest city in the entire world at that particular time. Uh, it was the capital city of Assyria, which meant that it was uh, the most powerful and dominating empire on earth at that time. But instead of going to Nineveh, which is 500 miles to the east of uh, Jerusalem, which you see on the map here, Jonah decides to go sailing 2,000 miles away to the most western point uh, that he would have known in that, in that day and age. Uh, he heads for Tarshish, the furthest point that's known to him. It's the Phoenician outpost in southwest Spain. Uh, it's a, at the very edge of the uh, Mediterranean world at that time. A little bit about Nineveh. Nineveh is a nasty and cruel place. It is not a good place to be. Uh, for example, the, the Assyrian policy was to never uh, keep, uh, was to keep their captives alive. And they gloated and enjoyed every atrocity that they would perpetrate on their captured enemies. They would hold their victims down, reach into their mouths and pull out their tongues. They would skin their victims alive. They would build pyramids of human skulls outside the cities that they had conquered. The cr their cruelty was known throughout the world, and frankly, Jonah hated these people. Jonah wanted nothing to do with them. He especially did not want them to repent and, and be blessed. He 
he, he, this was a group of people that he would have thought, I, I hope God judges them. I look forward to the day that fire rains down on this group of people. These are the worst types of people on earth. He had nothing, he wanted nothing to do with um, blessing and seeing those people uh, turn back to God. So Jonah hears clear direction from the Lord, but decides not to obey. But instead, they head in a completely different direction, right? Uh, and so my question to us is, do we ever do this? Surely we don't do this. You know, if we had actually heard God tell us something, we would do that, right? I mean, Christians around the world are known for being uh, people who, when they hear from God, Man, they, they move out. They do what, you know, when God says, um, you know, uh, go, go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, man, we do it. We're all involved right now. We could name our disciples, right? People who were, were discipling, we're back. No, not so much. Uh, you know, when, when the Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself. Man, we Christians, that's the one thing we got going for us. Everybody knows Christians love their neighbors as much or more than them. Right? No, not so much. Uh, you know, Jesus said, and we know he said it, if anyone wants to follow me, he's got to take up his cross, which means die to self. So whatever your plan is, that's done, <clears throat> and we say to God, whatever you want me to do, I, I, we all do. Do we ever struggle with that? I struggle with that. We all struggle with that. It, it, it's amazing how often we hear from God, and we either run the other direction or we just ignore it. Uh, we see this in our kids all the time. I did with my kids where you would say, mow the lawn, and they say, well, I cleaned the garage. You know, do your homework. Well, I organize my backpack. You know, we, we, we do stuff where, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I'm not mean to them. Well, okay, that's, that's a good first step, I guess. You know, um, we hear from God and, and, and don't follow through, just like Jonah does here. Well, check out what Jonah does in, in uh, Jonah 1.3. It says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, stop right there for a second, imagine that. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, to flee from the presence of the Lord. Good luck. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Is it possible to flee the presence of the Lord? Anyone? No. It's pretty difficult, right? But I think Jonah knew this. Uh, he's a prophet. He's, you know, he's in with God. He's, he's got a relationship with God. He's not ignorant of God. I think he knew that about God. Uh, but yet he tries to get away from God. And uh, again, it's a common experience that we all have. Uh, sometimes I think we try to... Um, escape the Lord's presence, but I think the, the antidote for this is to ask yourself the question, who, how big is my God? I mean, if your God is sort of like, you know, he's the man upstairs, you know, he's sort of like, a, he's, a, he's, he's like, like us, but he's got extra powers, you know, maybe he's sort of like a superman, he's a man, but he's really super. Um, then you might think, well, maybe I can hide from him. Maybe I can ignore him. Maybe if I distract him over here, hey, look, I'm doing this, he'll forget about this other thing that he asked me to do. But if we realize that our God <clears throat> is the God who spoke and a hundred million galaxies were put in place, if we realize that our God holds our universe, which is 300 billion light years across, in the palm of his hand, we begin to realize, I don't, I don't think I can flee from that God. You know, we realize that if, if our universe was the size of a quarter, I'm sorry, if our galaxy was the size of a quarter, our nearest star would be two 
football fields away. It would almost be at the Copper Cup from here. If our galaxy is the size of a quarter, you, can't, you don't hide from that God. This is the God who put, when he threw the 100 million galaxies into place, he wound up the stars so perfectly that they would all align just right when Christ arrived and there would be a special star in the sky when Christ was born that would draw the wise men. And if you've never heard the story of how NASA can take the movements of the stars and rewind them back and find 2,020 years ago um, that there was a, a a special star in the sky. It's an amazing story. We'll have to talk about that another time. But this is the God we serve. This is not some Superman, some man upstairs. This is the God you cannot run from. Um, and so, you know, going 500 miles to Tarshish is not going to help Jonah. So God continues to pursue Jonah, of course. And let's pick that up in verse 4. It says, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship was threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So, question for you, have you ever <clears throat> had God pursue you? God, you know, oftentimes uh, C.S. Lewis referred to the Holy Spirit as the hound of heaven. Who, who pursues us like a, like a dog would pursue a fox on a fox hunt. Um, I've had this experience. There was a time when I worked with Campus Crusade for Christ, and I was every day uh, discipling and um, having Bible study and working with college students. And one of the things we did was we had a, a weekly meeting, kind of like a church service, but it was um, different. But it was college, you know, it was designed for college students. And one of the things that we did during that time was we have a video that kind of opened, began our, our, our meeting. And it was always something fun and creative and just people would look forward to. And so I was in charge of creating those videos. And I took this student who I was in charge of um, building into, discipling, and we went to a bookstore in a mall. And we were going to do a funny little video where the camera would walk through the aisles of the bookstore and find this kid reading reading a book and, you know, say, hey, welcome to prime time. That's our, you know, the meeting we're at. So while we're there, the bookstore owner approaches us and says, uh, what are you guys doing here? You can't videotape the store. And <clears throat> I don't know why, a little uh, full disclosure here, I don't know why, but I lied. Just like that. I said, oh, uh, we're a couple college students, and we're filming a project for a class, which wasn't true. And he said, oh, oh, okay. You know, in that case, no problem. <clears throat> well, I'm here to tell you, the hound of heaven got after me. And for a week, I could not get away from God tapping me on the shoulder. What did you do? Why did you do that? You know that's wrong. You gotta make that right. You lied. You didn't just lie. You lied right in front of your disciple. Right in front of this kid you're supposed to be showing, you know, mentoring and, and building up in, in the things of the faith. What are you doing? I mean, I couldn't watch a movie. I couldn't have fun with friends. I could hardly sleep at night. It was unbelievable how God got after me. And so the next week, I had an appointment with that kid, and I, he said, what are we doing today? And I said, we're going back to that bookstore. Oh, really? Why? Well, you wouldn't believe the week I had. That's why. And we're going to go back, and we're going to, I'm, you know, i got to apologize to this bookstore owner. And we went back, I found the bookstore owner, he remembered us, and I said, i got to apologize to you, I lied to you. Here's what we're really doing with this Christian organization, and he said, oh, okay, well, you know, I forgive you, that, you know, don't worry about it, and just like that, the hound of heaven let me off. The guilt and the, and the shame was gone. God will pursue you. 
if, uh, if you're deciding to head the other direction. This storm was unbelievable. The mariners were terrified. They finally seek out Jonah, who's asleep, and they wake him up and they say, hey, whoever your God is, pray to him. We're trying to knock on every possible door and get some help here. Uh, see what you can do. Verse 10 says, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, uh, what is it that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because of what he had told them. Uh, so they uh, they talked to him, asked him what, he, what, he, what, what he's done. He explains it to them. They say, what should we do? And he says, well, I think you should throw me over overboard. And after some deliberation, it says in verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging, and the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. I bet they did. <laughs> I bet they did. Can you imagine uh, that, that happening? And just uh, those guys, I'm sure, knew that there's a God in heaven, and that Jonah's God is the one who is pursuing him. But the next thing that happens would really get your attention and it's also the part of the story that I think causes the most people problem, causes a problem for most people. Um, and it's interesting, but let's pick it up in verse 17. It says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And if you've ever shared your faith with people very much, you will inevitably hear this excuse that, oh, come on, you don't believe the Bible stuff. Do you? you don't believe that a fish ate Jonah. You know, that's, that's the key one that people will throw at you. As this is, you know, if there's any part of the Bible that's unbelievable, come on, you don't really believe this, do you? Well, uh, I don't know why people have a hard time with this, because in the first place, we hear that, that God speaks to Jonah, tells him what to do. And in my mind, I think, well, if you're going to grant me that there's a God who will speak to Jonah, then the fact that he can organize a fish to, to take care of him uh, should be, you know, no problem. But for some reason, the problem that most people have, uh, who are not people of faith, is with this idea that a fish would, would eat Joseph, uh, Jonah and that he would survive. But, uh, if you will do a little research on the internet, you will find that this happens um, often. There are many stories on the internet about people who have been eaten by a whale. This is one that I'm putting up on the screen right now. Uh, I read about one from uh, 18, this is a more modern one. There's one from 1891, where a guy named James Bartley, a sailor aboard a whaling ship, Star of the East was swallowed by a whale in the vicinity of the Falkland Islands. He was uh, within the whale for over 48 hours, and after he was found inside the whale, uh, which had been harpooned and brought onto the ship, and it took him about two weeks to recover from uh, being that or you know in that ordeal. But Sir Francis Fox wrote the following about this. He said, "Bartley affirms." that he probably would have lived inside the, his house of flesh until he starved, for he lost his senses through fright and not through lack of air. He remembers the sensation of being thrown out of the boat into the sea. He was then encompassed by a great darkness, and he felt that he was slipping along a smooth passage uh, of some sort that seemed to move off the wall. lasted but a short time and he realized he had more room. He felt about him and his hands came in contact with a yielding, slimy substance that seemed to shrink from his touch. It finally dawned upon him that he had been swallowed by the whale. He could easily breathe, but the heat was terrible. It was not a scorching, stifling nature, but it seemed to open the pores of his skin and draw out his vitality. His skin, where it was exposed to the action of the gastric juice, face, neck, and hands, were bleached to a deadly whiteness, 
and took on the appearance of parchment and never recovered its natural appearance, although otherwise his health did not seem affected by the terrible experience. And I have footnotes here of, of where that was found. Um, as I said, there are several other stories uh, on the web of people being swallowed by whales or other great fish. Jonah's, illustration, uh, Jonah's uh, experience here illustrates something, though, that I have found to be true, and maybe you found it to be true as well. God will sometimes use bad circumstances to get our attention. Have you ever had that happen? I, it happens to me often enough that, I, that I've started to get a Pavlovian response to, oh man, you know, something bad's happening. How am I with God? You know, is this possibly a wake-up call for me? Um, oftentimes, God will use difficult circumstances to get our attention. Now, I'm always very quick to say when people will ask me, you know, why did God uh, cause my leg to get broken? Why did God cause my mother to die? You know, these kinds of things. I'm always very quick to say, now, God doesn't cause always cause uh, difficult, sad um, certain situations in our lives. And I will point out, <clears throat> you know, why do good, bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen in our world? Why is there sin and suffering? It is because we live in a broken world. This is not the world that God intended and created. Adam and Eve, that whole story happened. Our world is broken, and now <clears throat> sin and suffering and pain is a part of our story. Oftentimes, the suffering we go through <clears throat> breaks, <coughs> excuse me, breaks God's heart as much as it breaks our heart. But there are times, I believe, when God uses and causes calamity, not just allowing it, but causing it in order to get our attention, in order to bring us back to um, to where He'd like us to be, to put us back on the path that maybe we've wandered off from. Um, God will sometimes use dramatic measures to bring us back to himself. Well, what can we uh, glean from this story, this first chapter of Jonah, as application? What can we, in the 21st century, uh, gain from this? Well, I started out by acknowledging that many of us have a running away story. Uh, and I just, I guess I would ask you, if you haven't physically ran away from home, uh, is there anything that you're kind of running away from God on? What is, what is your minimum? Has God laid something on your heart over the past few months or weeks or days that you know God wants you to fill in the blank? But you're kind of heading in a different direction. You're putting your spiritual fingers in your spiritual ears and saying, la, 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 I don't hear that. Uh, you're looking in a different direction. Is God asking you to mend a relationship? Has God uh, put someone uh, on your heart to share Christ with, talk about your faith with, tell your testimony to, but you're just afraid of, to do that and you're not doing it? Is there anyone in your life who you've kind of put in the, I'm done with you box? And God is saying, no, you need to take them out of that box. Is God nudging you maybe to speak up in class or at work about your faith? And that scares you. Is God maybe leading you or nudging you to uh, take up a leadership role, maybe here at the church, and you're not so sure about that? Parents, do you have a difficult conversation that you need to have with your children, maybe an adult child, that you've been putting off when you get a sense that God really wants you to have that conversation? Uh, if you sense that God is leading, me, leading you, let me encourage you to move toward doing that quickly. You know, we're all familiar with the story of uh, David and Goliath, right? David's a little boy, never been a, a soldier or a warrior, goes up against Goliath, who is a giant. He's, you know, bigger and taller than most people. And he is a warrior. He's covered in armor. 
and the two of them go together. David gets convinced uh, through whatever means that God wants him to battle Goliath, right? And there's a little verse in that story that I want to call your attention to that God has used in my life many times. And it's 1 Samuel 17, verse 48. And it says this, As the Philistine, that's Goliath, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. So I, I would encourage you to memorize that little bit of scripture. I have thought of this verse many times when I have been convinced God wants me to do something. Usually it's share my faith with someone. Uh, that God will also remind you of this verse and say, David ran quickly to the battle line. Don't put it off. Go do it right now. Uh, when I knew that God wanted me to share my faith, David ran quickly to the battle line. When I sensed a call to step, to step out in faith, David ran quickly to the battle line. When God asks you to forgive your spouse, Say it with me. David ran quickly to the battle line. When you know you need to confront sin, say it with me. David ran quickly to the battle line. When God points you towards your Nineveh, say it with me. David ran quickly to the battle line. Let's close today in prayer. Father, thank you for this wonderful story of Jonah showing us um, this prophet who, like we do so often, heard you clearly give direction and ran the other way. Lord, we ask you to forgive us when we do that. We thank you for the fact that you have forgiven us. Lord, we, uh, we ask that in the future, as we get convinced that there's something you want us to do, big or small, that we would be like David and run quickly to the battle line. Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Amen.